أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to the second day of us commemorating the month of Muharram. Every aspect of this program is important. The poetry which we hear before, which connects the past to the present and the future. The masa'ib that we'll listen to afterwards, where our hearts and minds, inshallah, will travel to Karbala. And the lessons, the practical lessons that we try to get from Quran and Sunnah, as we try to prepare for the Imam of the time. Now, brothers and sisters, we said that this month, these 10 days, inshallah, we're going to be learning from the story of Nabi Lut. And we'll be getting some powerful lessons, inshallah, life-changing lessons, relevant lessons from this story. As the Quran tells us, and this is in Surah Yusuf, so Surah number 12, verse number 11, Allah says this in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٍ الْأَلْبَابِ Truly, in their stories, are powerful lessons, are ibra. We're not telling these stories just to talk about history. We're trying to learn lessons, we're trying to prepare ourselves, so that inshallah, we're ready when Allah's test comes. And hopefully we can be those people who don't falter. Instead, we stand strong. Now, you and I, I'm sure all of us have noticed this. Whenever we hear a story that was out of the normal in this way, let's say we hear a story about someone who is a psychopath or a serial killer, right? Somebody's unhinged. They've, one of the things that comes to mind is how did this happen? Was this just all of a sudden somebody just woke up and they went crazy, right? What led up to this? Why in this way? Why in this manner? So anytime we hear something that's really, really strange, that's something that comes to mind. And when you and I get a little further into the story of Nabi Lut, we should ask that same question. I want to share, brothers and sisters, some of the verses. Remember I told you that in 82 times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this story. What is God trying to teach us? Why is this story so important? Why would our prophet be worried about his ummah? Why did God have to make sure that mankind heard this story? Some of these verses, I'd like to give brothers and sisters the references. Later, they can look at these verses. Especially, brothers and sisters, pay attention to the Arabic of the verses and see the messages that you can derive just from looking at the verses yourselves and pondering with a pure heart when we refer to Quran. So what happens is when we, again, those questions, right? Why is it that Allah, who is Arhamur Rahimeen, the most merciful, would destroy these people with three types of of supernatural punishment. Later when we get to the thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rains stones on them. There's going to be a terrible cry from heaven that's going to eradicate them. And God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will flip that town, those towns upside down. Three supernatural punishments. What was the crime? What happened? How did they get there? These are people with a fitrah. And brothers and sisters, there's one time when you and I are just, again, going over this story, so we can talk about how bad they were. But in this story, you're going to see, we're going to read the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, initially, they weren't a bad people. Wait till you hear the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt. There are lessons for you and I. As believers, as practical believers who Allah has blessed on being on the path of wilaya, why is it people would flip and go that off? So let's look at some of the ahadith 
or some, sorry, some of the verses of the Quran, but you'll see that they're so far from Allah's mercy. Allah who sent Nabi Lut in the beginning. This is a story of compassion. Sent Nabi Lut in the beginning. Towards the end of the story, even the shafa'a, the intercession of Ibrahim, Khalilur Rahman, that's not enough to save these people. Let's pay attention to the Arabic of some of these verses. So this one, this first verse that I'd like us to just ponder over is surah number 11 and verse number 75. This is what Allah says. So the angels, we're going to read about this later. We'll hear about this later. Before they come to the people of Lut to eradicate those people, first they go to Nabi Ibrahim. They give him the good tidings of a son, a Nabi, a prophet, and then also they explain that we also are here to take care of some terrible people. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he first starts to negotiate, to try and ask God, maybe they can be spared. Listen to what the angels tell Ibrahim. They say, Ya Ibrahim, O Ibrahim, A'rid an hadha. Ibrahim, leave the, these guys are gone. No use pleading for, you Ibrahim, Khalilur Rahman. Don't even plead for these guys. Don't ask for intercession for these, these guys. What does it say? Innahu qadja amru rabbik. The command of your Lord has arrived. Wa innahum atihum adabun ghayru mardud. There is a punishment, an adab, a chastisement, which is coming down on these people for their wickedness, which will never be turned away. It can't be deterred. So Allah, who's Arhamur Rahimin, who sent his beloved prophet Lut to try and save these people, they were militant about what they did, and even the intercession of Nabi Ibrahim can't save them. Some other verses, brothers and sisters, just for us to think about. Remember, this story is going to end with a mob gathered outside the house of a Nabi. A mob. The Quran describes how the mob was. It was so many people, remember in the story, there was malaika, angels, who come in the form of human beings to the wife, to the house of a nabi, nabi Lut. The mob hears about it. What does the mob do? This is Surah 15, verse number 67. Waja'a ahlul Madina. The people of the city, remember there's several towns, the people of the city, so many people, it wasn't just like a small crowd. The crowd is charging, the mob is there, surrounding the house of the Nabi. What, did, what were they doing though? Yastabshirun. They were so far gone in their deviation. They're giving each other good tidings. There's a few guests giving each other good tidings. What else? The Quran says, this is now Surah <clears throat> number 11, verse number 78. Qawmu. The qawm of Nabi Lut came to him, Yuhra'una ilay. Yuhra'un, brothers and sisters, is in the majhul. It's not even in, so what happens is there's the majhul and, let me just do the English of it. There's one time when the doer of the action is known to us, Ja'a Zaydun, Zaid came, Zaid is here. The doer of the action is known to us. There's another time when the doer of the action is unknown. Right? Somebody hits somebody. Qutil al Hussein. Let's say, Qutil al Hussein. Hussein is killed. Who killed him? It's not even mentioned. What happens is the, the crowd, they're so far gone in their shahwa and lust. The Quran says, as if they were being dragged, these people are so far gone. So they surround the house of that Nabi, that prophet. The prophet is resisting. He comes out of his house to defend his guests. The prophet's not afraid to lay down his life. He's going to defend his guests. He comes out to defend them. You'll hear later the conversation, how the prophet tries to reason with them, to talk to them, somehow dissuade them from the chastisement of Allah. No one willing to listen until they attack the house. Nabi Lut is cast aside. They break down the door according to some ahadith, and then that chastisement comes down. So our, back to our original question. What happened? How, can, how could this happen? People who have a fitrah, what are lessons for us now? How serious is this sin? 
What happened? Well, we're going to learn, and we're going to see later gradually how shaitan was able to bring people along step by step. But brothers and sisters, it's not just about the home of loot. It's about our own self-development, our own responsibilities. Times when you and I realize we have a duty, Allah wants us to do it. What happens? You're going to see this later. In this community, right had become wrong and wrong had become right. Being pure in this community is a crime. Nabi Lut reasons with them. He talks with them. He warns them. Listen to the, what the Quran says. Surah 27, verse number 56. So Nabi Lut, later we're going to discover, what was the method of Nabi Lut? How did he stop? What did he say? فَمَا كَانَ جَوَابَ قَوْمِهِ His people didn't say anything else. All of Nabi Lut's istidlal, proof, ayat, Quran, everything, what did he have to say? They didn't have any answer for him, illa, except that they said this, qalu, they said, akhriju ala lutin min qaryatikum. Drive out the family of lut, all the lut, drive all of them out of your city, out of your village, out of your place. Why are, why are you driving them out? Innahum unasun yatataharun. There are people who want to stay pure. The crime is to stay pure. So far gone, so wicked. You, you want to stay pure? Oh, that's enough for you to be banished. To say this. So, how did somebody get there? But first, please, as salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, brothers and sisters, by the way, we do see this in modern times. We're staying pure, doing the right thing, practicing according to the fitra, becomes wrong. You're trying to do things that any wise person would be like, well, this is a great thing to do. Brothers and sisters, remember, for this Muharram, we're also paying attention to current events. None of us have forgotten Kashmir. None of us have forgotten Nigeria. Maybe you heard, just before Muharram began in Nigeria, just before Muharram began, the government authorities over in Nigeria, they banned the Islamic movement. They issued warrants for their arrest. They said to destroy their, their they have a national structure. They're offering services all over Nigeria. They said destroy that structure. Right becomes wrong, wrong becomes right. Right becomes wrong and wrong becomes right. And by the way, you see this also in Karbala. You see this also in Karbala. I want to share a hadith from Karbala. Again, we can see these parallels. And then after that, how does this apply to us? How does it, are there any lessons in this for us? Any things we should be worried about? Karbala. So the Imam, the fourth Imam is now speaking. And he's talking about how backwards things got how wrong things were. He's talking about the most difficult days that were ever there for Rasulullah. One of them is for Rasulullah to even imagine what was going to happen in Karbala. What happened in Karbala? The Imam explains. He says that army of people who were going out to face the tiny group, 72, 100 and something people of Imam Hussein. This is what he says about them. So this group was going out and each one of them thought they were part of this ummah. They think they're part of the Ummah of Rasulullah. Who are they going to kill? The, do the son of Fatima. But what was their niyyah? How backwards had things gotten? This is what the Imam says. Kullun yataqarrabu ila Allah azza wa jal Allahu Akbar. Each one of them was trying to get closer to God. Qurbatan ila Allah. I'm going to go over and I'm going to murder the son of Fatima. How does that happen? What goes wrong? What happens in an ummah? What do we have to do to make sure that nothing like that ever, ever happens? He says that they came to, with the niya qurbatan ilallah to go over and kill him. And he says, wa huwa billah yudhakiruhum. The ironic thing was this, Imam Hussein, he's warning them about God. He's reminding them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you qurbatan ilallah? 
run over his body on, with horses? How? What happens? He was reminding them about God. And they weren't accepting any sort of reminders. So what happened? Imam Hussein talks about it, by the way. right? Because later on, we, well, what happened? What are those sins? What do we need to be careful about? By the way, brothers and sisters, one reminder for all of us, and especially myself, when it comes to Karbala and those other events, other important events in Islam, is to remind ourselves that you and I, we can slip also. Zubair, remember the story of Zubair? He's maybe, Zubair in the time, the, the same Zubair who came to the house of Lady Fatima. The same Zubair who's one of those people with the sword to defend Hazar Fatima when they came to burn the house down. Maybe the fifth person to accept Islam on the face of the earth. Zubair flipped. How much of warning should there be for us? How careful should we be? Should we think we're fixed, we're in just because we're commemorating? You want to know something? How many times, brothers and sisters, do you think Shimr made Hajj? How many times is good? Shimr, the same person who later, sitting on the chest of Imam Hussein, when, when the enemies of the enemy, of the enemies were thinking, okay, well, let's negotiate with Imam Hussein. Shimr is like, oh, if you can't do it, I'll do it. How many times did Shimr make Hajj? 16 times Hajj. 16 times he made Hajj. So these things are very real. Nobody should consider themselves safe or Alhamdulillah, I'm definitely going to paradise. No, there are big lessons in this. Now, the main point that I'm going to try to get to, well, today we're going to cover part of the point. Today, inshallah, we'll cover part of the point. But one thing that I'd like to share with brothers and sisters is that shaitan, iblis, is a hunter. Look at the words of the Ahlul Bayt. Iblis is a hunter. And like any good hunter, he's patient when it comes time to trap his prey. You and I need to be scared of any small sin that we think it's normal. It's, later, wait till you hear the story of how did this start for the Qom of Lut? They were such good people. What, what was even their sin? Right? What's even the connection between the two? Wait till you hear that. But Shaitan, keep this in mind, Shaitan is a hunter. He waits and sees mistakes that people are making, sins people are committing. He waits until those times when now the divine test comes, the pressure comes, Allah revealed to this or that person that this is a problem area, you got to fix this. Allah revealed it ahead of time. The person didn't address it. They allowed the sin to fester. Then shaitan comes at the right time. So let's listen to this one hadith is from Imam Sadiq. Salamullah alayhi salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is what, Shay, uh, what Imam Sadiq says about shaitan. He says, لَقَدْ نَسَبَ إِبْلِيسُ حَبَائِلَهُ فِي دَارِ الْغُرُورِ Iblis has set up his traps, his snares in this world. The دَارُ الْغُرُورِ This place of treachery and trickery. فَمَا يَقْصُدُ بِهَا فِيهَا إِلَّا أَوْلِيَاءَنَا He's not expecting to capture in his traps anyone except our awliya, our friends. He looks for the Shia. He wants to get them. Remember in the Battle of Uhud? In the Battle of Uhud, people abandoned Rasulullah. Rasulullah was calling them back. Ilayya, come back. I'm Rasulullah. Who are the enemies? In Uhud, it's Hind. Remember how she mutilated the body of Hamza? That kind of a person, that wild kind of a person. And I leave Rasulullah. When the Quran talks about it, he says that shaitan is tazallahum. Shaitan got them to make, to slip with some of the sins that they had done. So shaitan waited, he saw certain sins. So brothers and sisters, if Allah reveals to us that we have a certain spiritual trait that we have to work on, there's a problem area, an area I'm struggling in. 
that is a lut from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a warning sign for us, something to take seriously. Now back to the ahadith, a little bit. This first hadith is from Imam Baqir. So now what are we doing? That original question was, how did they slip? Where did they go? What went wrong to the qawm of Lut? This is what the Imam says. He says, كَانَ قَوْمُ لُوتْ مَنْ أَفْذَ لِقَوْمًا خَلَقَهُمُ The people of Lut were actually one of the best people, best nations that Allah ever created. They were good people. One of the researchers was doing research on this. A wonderful sheikh was doing research on this. He was like, the people of Lut weren't mushrikeen. They weren't polytheists. Where do you find in the Quran that Nabi Lut is talking to them that you're doing shirk? They were good people. Listen. He says, فطلب, فطلبهم إبليس الطلب الشديد. Iblis saw that they were good people. Iblis said, ah, let me get these guys. What were, what were some of their good traits? What happens is they have good traits and Iblis is going to use that. Even good traits we have to be careful about to make sure Iblis can't use them. It says, وَكَانَ مَنْ فَضْلِهِمْ وَخَيْرَتِهِمْ And they, were, they had some good traits. One of their good traits were these people were organized. These people would do work as a group. Their men would go out to work. As a group, their women would stay behind, tend for the children. That's a great thing. Wonderful people, good people. So what happened to Iblis? فَلَمَّا حَسَدَهُمْ Iblis لِعِبَادَتِهِمْ Iblis became jealous of these people because of their worship. And Iblis later on will figure out what was Iblis's plan. How did Shaitan get these people to change? So now, before I share how he got them to change, there's an important point for you and I to keep in mind. And the reason for sharing this important point and, st and taking time on this point is that you and I, brothers and sisters, we're living here in America. We're living here in America. Because we're living here in America, us or our children are going to school here. They grew up here. When you grow up in these countries, away from the Islamic lands, it's natural that a certain part of the culture we take on as our own, we don't think about it, we don't necessarily think, I'm going to talk about later about the concept of being a cultural Muslim versus an ideological Muslim. Sometimes someone, a good person, born outside of the lands of Islam, and now with the internet, even sometimes in the lands of Islam, sometimes, without thinking about it, we can have assumed certain things. I'll give you an example. I was over there giving a lecture one time. I remember this very clearly. Not a lecture, it was a course. So you know, a course is different from a lecture. There's two-way traffic. You're talking to the people. You're interacting with the people. And I wanted to go over and establish a really important point, but it was against what the West says. It wasn't politically correct. It was a very important point. It was going to help solve a lot of issues, but it's not politically correct. It's not what everybody's taught in school. When I'm saying the same things everybody else is taught in school, everybody's head's nodding, yeah, yeah, yeah. Islam says that, power to Islam. Then you go over and you share something that's not politically correct. So I remember sharing a verse of the Quran, and I looked at the faces of the audience. And I'm thinking, you know, once I share a verse of the Quran, that's it. This is a knockout punch. I'm Mike Tyson. This is the ayat of Quran. That's it. Knockout. I shared the ayat of Quran. And I remember one of the sisters was looking at me. So? You wish you were knocked out. I'm thinking, oh, it's an ayat of Quran. Why not? You know, it's all over now. Sometimes, if this, the part that I want to share now, if that's not shared, just sharing the ayat of the Quran, we're over here. We're over here in these countries. This is a challenge. Brothers and sisters, when you're here, outside of the lands of Islam, you're the front lines of Islam. The rewards that you get for practicing Islam, for holding on to your faith. I mentioned that hadith from Imam Sajjad yesterday. In one of the hadith, the Imam says, when your Imam is absent, what's the difference between when your Imam is absent, he's in the ghaibah, and when your Imam is present? 
He says that your prayers have 25 times the value when you're offering them when your imam is absent. Imam Ali says, the greater the challenge, the greater the reward. So by staying here, by resisting, you're getting great reward. But we also have to be ready for that challenge. So now, what I'm going to try and share with you, brothers and sisters, is this. According to Islam, no one is born gay. Nobody's born gay. Right? The opposite of what they're feeding us. The pseudoscience, the intellectual mumbo jumbo that they're trying to feed us. From an Islamic point of view, we say that no, nobody's, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in detail because we have to go over and be able to address these things properly. We have to be able to defend ourselves. How can you go over and say that? Let me get to it, one at a time. Brothers and sisters, in order for you and I to be on the winning team, in order for you and I to have iman, faith, which is ashurai. Everybody's faith is not ashurai. There's some people, Muslims, they go over qurbatan Allah to kill Imam Hussein. You and I were waiting for the 12th Imam. We want our faith to be ashurai. How do you have faith which is Ashurai? There's conditions for faith which is Ashurai. There are three conditions in order for the faith to be Ashurai. One of the conditions is intellectual conviction. You and I personally have to be convinced that the Quran is God's book. It's not because of my family or my friends. I'm not a cultural Muslim. If everybody on the earth turns away, everybody on the earth turns away from Islam, I can't unlearn the truth. I know what the truth is. I remind you of what was said when Imam Hussein told his companions to leave. Remember this in Karbala? What the companions said? He says, Wallah, faith which is Ashurai. Wallah, law alimtu. If I knew this to be true, anni uqtal, thumma uhya, I would be killed, then brought back to life. Thumma uhraq, after that I would be set aflame. Thumma uhya, then, then brought to life again. Thumma uthra, after that they would scatter my ashes in the heavens. He says, yuf alobi thalika sab'ina marra ma faraktuka. He says, if I knew that this would happen to me, be taken, killed, burned, my ashes scattered. He said, I would never have abandoned you, Imam Hussein. I can't unlearn the truth. My faith is Ashurai. I'm convinced. Everybody else leave. Not me. Intellectual conviction. Intellectual conviction is very, very important. If I'm a cultural Muslim, why are you here for Muharram? Oh, my daddy and mommy, they brought me here. I don't even want to be here. Or maybe I am here, and I want to be here, but I'm not grounded. I'm not an ideological Muslim. You know what? Let me, it's a little bit scary, but let me share the hadith anyways from Imam Sadat. He says, Man dakhala fi hadha deen birrijal. That person who enters Islam, become a Muslim. But I'm not an ideological Muslim. I'm a Muslim because other people are Muslims. They enter this religion because of people. The same way people brought him into Islam, people will also be able to bring this person out. They'll go to college. Somebody starts badgering them about their beliefs. They don't have intellectual answers. The same way people brought them in, people can bring them out. But that person who comes into Islam, bil kitab wa sunnah, I'm convinced. I know that the Quran is God's book. He says, this person, zala til jibal qabla in yazu. Mountains will move. This person is not going to move. I'm convinced. Brothers and sisters, there's a challenge that you and I face. The challenge that you and I face is this. Sometimes for our children, and Allah bless our children, Allah bless our children. You and I, sometimes we're convinced about Islam, but for our children, Islam is a gift. 
the light still hasn't went off. They're practicing, they're doing the right things, but the intellectual conviction that still hasn't happened. Sometimes what happens is Islam is a gift, which is beautiful. The person's at a big advantage, but because the person has never seen the other side, they can be what, swept away. They're a cultural Muslim, not an ideological Muslim. You and I, our job, brothers and sisters, some of you are educators. Each one of you have a circle of influence. You have people who are around you. One of your jobs is to make sure everybody's ideologically convinced about the religion. One of the most important traits of the Shia is that deep understanding of the religion. This is the hadith that says, Uffin li kulli muslimin. Woe to every Muslim. La yaj'al fi kulli jumu'atin yawman yatafaqahu fihi amra dine. Woe be upon that Muslim who once a week does not engage in that deep yatafaqah, that deep understanding about his religion, wa yas'alu an dine, and acts about his religion, to have that firm understanding. So the person doesn't go over and get confused or lost. Sometimes people get confused or they get lost. I remember a story, and inshallah, it's not true. They said once this lady was teaching in a public school, and she was teaching these little kids. And so she came into the school, and she's real proud. You know how strong the, the other side is. So she comes into the school, and she's like, kids, I'm an atheist. Kids are all listening. She said, who's an atheist? And all the little kids raised their hand. They didn't know what being an atheist means. I want to be like the teacher, raise their hand. Right? And then she noticed in the back of the class, there's a little girl sitting, a little girl named Maryam, a little Muslim girl. She's sitting in the back of the class. She was like, everybody else is raising, Maryam, why aren't you raising your hand? She said, uh, I'm not an atheist. She said, you're not? Well, what are you? She said, I'm a Muslim. She said, That's, why are you a Muslim? She said, well, my daddy's a Muslim. My mommy's a Muslim. I grew up knowing God. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. She said, that's no answer. What if your dad was a moron? Your mother was a moron. Then what would you be? The little girl paused. She said, then I'd be an atheist. <laughs> I'm intellectually convinced. I know what the truth is. The majority are doing this. Back to the story of Nabi Lut. Remember the, 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 the girls? The whole community has abandoned the way of the fitrah. But you don't hear anywhere in the Quran that those girls who are heroines are saying, love has no gender. They're not, everybody else going wrong. I'm not crazy. I know what's true. Intellectual conviction. So what happens is, if we're just a Muslim who is a cultural Muslim, and not an ideological Muslim, even sometimes when we're age engaging in acts of ibadah and worship, but we haven't gone over and given it much thought. Sometimes the more we act, the faster we go, it's hadith, the closer we are to losing the way. The person is a cultural Muslim, very, very outwardly religious, not convinced on the inside. The hadith says this, the person, al-amil ala ghayr basira, the person who's acting without insight. I don't even know why I'm a Muslim. This person, kasair ala ghayri tariq. is like a person who's traveling on the wrong path. The faster they go, the hadith says, it increases them in distance. You're wrong, moving in the wrong direction. So just actions without thinking, that's not what it says in Islam. I remember that other story that's not true. They said, inshallah, it's not true. This one guy, he went to a hospital, and he came into the hospital, and they brought him in. They see the guy has two burned ears. So they said, what happened? He said, oh, I was ironing. I was ironing my clothes, and somebody called on the phone, and I tried to answer the phone, and I burned my ear. They said, subhanAllah, that's terrible. But tell me, why did you burn your other ear? He said, they called back. I'm doing actions, but no thought behind it, right? The Quran, these are important now, because we're going to get to why, that, to answering the question, right? The Quran values faith when you and I are intellectually convinced. 
This is a realization. Islam is a real, in order for us to, to be Ashurai, it's in a realization. We don't abandon our men mental faculties in order to be embrace the religion. Brothers and sisters, some of us may know people who've come into Islam from a Christian background. Some of them will share with you that as a Christian, I knew that there was a time when my beliefs, there was a contradiction. I never addressed it. Islam doesn't say that. What does Islam say? Surah 39, verse number 17 and 18. فَبَشِّرْ ibad. God says, give good tidings to my servants. Who are my servants? الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ those who listen carefully to the word, ahsana, and then they follow the best of it. Why do I follow Islam? Because it's the truth? Because it makes sense? Because I can get answers? That's the Islam we're supposed to be following. Now, there is something else that you and I need to keep in mind and make sure this doesn't creep into the Islam that we're preaching. One time, one reason people abandon religion as a whole is when they see that religion is nothing but meaningless rituals. Rituals, very important. What's the meaning behind the rituals? Sometimes this happens among Shias, by the way. Meaningless rituals. If they see religion as a whole doesn't have answers for the problems we're going through as a society, if there was a religion, there's full of contradictions. It doesn't even have answers for the stuff we're going to. We have to look outside of Islam for relief, for sources, for comfort. Because Islam doesn't provide us with... Or, it's a religion that doesn't stand up to oppressors. It's in Islam, but it doesn't stand up to oppressors. It doesn't stand up to tyrants. It doesn't empower me when it comes to thalimin. They see that kind of a religion, and those people who are aware, how can I follow that? So what happens is, Islam is something different. Islam, as it says in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلُنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ We have sent our messengers with proofs. That's that religion and the religion of Islam. Okay, so one last point, and then after that, the point of the main point that I need to share tonight, right? We're going step by step so we do the story properly. That, oh wow. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajo. The last point that I want to share tonight, we're going to, so our point what, that we started off with was this. The idea that nobody's born gay. And the reason we're going to say that is based on Qur'an and Sunnah. Why, can, why is Qur'an and Sunnah a proof for us? Because we're intellectually convinced. Then we accept Qur'an and Sunnah. Then the ayat of the Qur'an makes sense to us. When we hear the warnings of Lut in the Qur'an, this is God's book, Allah's speaking. So what did happen to those people? What was the problem with the Qawm of Lut in order for us to be aware of and be careful? Remember I mentioned that you and I, sometimes Allah reveals to us that we have a spiritual disease, an area to work on. What was the crime of the people of Lut? And then what did it lead to? The people of Lut, you know what their problem was? They were bakhil. They were stingy. They were stingy. What happened to the people of Lut? They were in an area, this is modern day, about research is saying, modern day Jordan. Very nice town, good climate, they're prosperous people, well off, doing fine, things are okay. And because their town was on one of those places where a lot of people would travel, people would go over and they would travel, and when they're traveling they used to come by the people of Lut. And they used to have to serve them as guests. But financially, they didn't have any need for them. You know, nowadays, people like the tourist industry. The tourist industry is a way of bringing money. But let's say you're people, I don't need money. Every day we have to go over and feed these people. So because of their bukhl, Imam, Imam Baqir says they had very severe bukhl, these individuals, they said, you know what? Let's do something so we don't have guests. 
Let's do something so terrible. It spreads around to the other cities and everybody knows to stay away from this city. And there's no time tonight for me to go over and explain the rest of the hadith. We'll summarize it in this. Shaitan, Iblis, came to them, taught them something. Iblis taught them. No qom, no people had ever done this in history before. Iblis taught them something that they're supposed to do. And when you do this, nobody else will come to this town. So initially, it was rape, and rape was a weapon. It wasn't from Shahwa initially. And then the, the hadith tells us what happened, what happened to their women, where did it lead them, but we'll have to leave that for another time.